When you look at a world map, you begin to get an idea of just how big Russia is. The world's biggest country is simply massive. Russia is almost twice the size of the United States and about 70 times bigger than that of the UK. At over 170 million square kilometers, Russia takes up roughly one-eighth of the world's landmass. It covers 11 time zones and its borders reach three oceans, the Pacific, the Arctic, and the Atlantic. If you wanted to travel from Moscow to Vladivostok, Russia's most eastern city, you'd be looking at a drive of around 10,000 kilometers, or one week on a train. So why is Russia so big? How did it accumulate so much territory, and just how much of Russia is inhabitable? For hundreds of years, Russia was quite a modest size. It wasn't until the 16th century that Russian expansion really took off, swallowing up huge areas of land, especially to the east. The area that we now know as Ukraine was originally settled by Slavic tribes. In 862, the Viking king Oleg established Kiev as the kingdom of the Kievian Rus. These people were able to form what has become the Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian states. The Kievan Rus kingdom began to spread, acquiring land to the south and north, reaching its peak in the mid-10th century. In 1147, Moscow was founded by Yuri Dolguruki on the banks of the Muskva River. At the same time, the Mongol Empire was gaining rapidly in power, and in 1237, Mongol forces marched into Russian territory, seizing Kiev and Moscow. At the time, Moscow and the surrounding Russian territories were incredibly hard to defend. There was no mountain ranges, deserts, or even forests to slow down the attacking armies. Moscow was essentially stranded on flat terrain, open for invasion. The Mongols ruled over Russian territories until 1480, when things began to change. In 1533, Ivan IV, or Ivan the Terrible, took control of Russia and immediately went to work. He made his intentions of expansion known when he crowned himself the Tsar of all Russia. The title Tsar came from the Roman Caesar, and Ivan regarded Russia as the new Roman Empire. He decided Russia had no choice but to go on the offensive. Instead of sitting back vainly repelling invaders, Ivan wanted to expand Russia's borders, thereby making it more and more difficult for enemy forces to progress. The first obstacle was the Tartar Khanate. They were of Turkish origin and joined with the Mongol Empire in the 15th century. They controlled Moscow and Kiev up until they were eventually overthrown by Ivan III in 1480. Even though Russia had freed itself of the Tartar shackles, they still remained just to the east of Moscow in the Tartar capital of Kazan. Ivan the Terrible was keen to expand Russia to the east, and Kazan stood in the way. Just beyond Kazan to the east lies the Ural mountain range that runs north to south through Russia. Ivan knew that if he could take Kazan, then he just needed to cross the Urals and claim the massive expanse of land that ran all the way east to the Pacific Ocean. And so began the Siege of Kazan in 1552. It was to prove one of the most momentous events for Russia's history, for it began to shape the enormous landmass that we see today. Ivan the Terrible's army of 150,000 men formed a week-long siege outside the city of Kazan, bombarding the Tartar forces into submission. With Kazan falling into Russian hands, the path was clear for Ivan the Terrible to advance over the Urals into Siberia. This expansion across Siberia, all the way to the Pacific, enabled Russia to become the biggest country in the world. It accounts for roughly 77% of Russian territory. To give you an idea of just how gigantic Siberia is, we can compare it to Canada, the world's second biggest country. Canada has a landmass of almost 10 million square kilometers. Siberia alone covers well over 13 million square kilometers. The taking of Siberia was done with relative ease. For starters, much of Siberia was already largely uninhabited. A significant size of the land was, and still is, barren, devoid of vegetation or wildlife, and subject to extreme conditions in winter. This meant that few other countries were interested in claiming the region, much less settling there. There are currently only three people per square kilometer in Siberia, and that number was still lower than when Russian forces plowed through in the 16th century. Added to that was the fact that anyone living there tended to be people of nomadic tribes, and some were even indifferent to the Russian presence. Even if they opposed it, they had no established cities or empires to challenge the invading Russians. There were also no real geographical borders or barriers stopping the Great Eastern Expansion. Beyond the Ural Mountains, the Siberian plains were notoriously flat, and they had no imposing mountain ranges or canyons. Siberia was basically there for the taking. A major incentive for settling Siberia was the abundance of agricultural land that was available. The Russians were already drawn to the Siberian furs that were especially sought after for trade with European countries. Gradually, Siberia was settled, albeit sparsely, and in 1639, the explorer Ivan Moskvitin reached the Pacific Ocean coast. By this time, there were approximately 200,000 Russians living throughout Siberia. But the Russian thirst for new territories was far from satisfied. When Peter I, or Peter the Great, came into power, 
Russia continued to expand. The Rostov region to the southwest of Moscow near Ukraine was settled and remains part of Russia today. In 1703, Peter the Great also established St. Petersburg in northwestern Russia. It was originally a Swedish fortress, but Peter wanted it for Russia's new capital. He had grand visions of a Russian city that would be the hub of economic and cultural activity. Strategically, it made sense, being located on the Gulf of Finland with great potential to become a powerful port city. Today, that dream has very much been realized. St. Petersburg is a bustling, vibrant city of over 5 million people and is undeniably Russia's cosmopolitan capital. Peter the Great was instrumental in expanding Russia's northwestern borders. He was able to settle in the Ingria and Karelia regions, which are currently shared with Finland. This continued under the rule of Anna of Russia and Elizabeth of Russia, with much of Russia's current northwestern and southeastern land being acquired. Gaining new territory to the west and south was much tougher going for Russia. Here, they faced stiff opposition from established states such as Poland and Turkey. In the early 19th century, under the rule of Alexander I, Russia enjoyed success in claiming key parts of the Caucasus region to the south. There was, and still is, a great motivation to control the Caucasus. To do so meant being able to keep the Ottoman Empire in check as well as having access to the Black Sea. The Black Sea has long been critical to Russia and Central Asian countries. It not only links Asia with Europe, but the Dardanelles in the southwestern corner, and it also links the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. Gaining a foothold in Caucasus was furthermore a massive strategic boost for Russia because of the Caucasus mountain range. These mountains run from the Black Sea across to the Caspian Sea, separating Europe. Once Russia had secured territory in the northern Caucasus, the capital St. Petersburg seemed impregnable. The mountains formed a solid defensive wall against any invaders from the south. Enemies were also highly unlikely to come from the Arctic North, and anyone coming from the west would have to fight their way through several Russian strongholds. Russia continued to accumulate territories throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, many of which have since been given up and granted independence. These include Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Finland, Belarus, Estonia, and portions of Ukraine and Georgia. And still, Russia remains the world's biggest country. And yet, compared to other giants such as the US and China, Russia is largely uninhabitable. At least 70% of Russians live on the European side to the west. Most of the Russian north and Siberian plateaus have extremely hostile environments, meaning around 65% of Russia is absolutely uninhabitable. This accounts for its relatively small population of just over 140 million people. This is half of Indonesia's population, despite being around nine times the size. It's not only Russia, though, that has large areas of uninhabitable land. Canada and Australia are other large countries, and much of their interiors is highly unsuitable for human settlement. 70% of Australia is either arid or semi-arid, meaning about 40% of the country is inhabitable. 90% of Canada is uninhabited due to its central and northern regions being barely arable and suffering from permafrost, when the ground remains frozen at zero degrees Celsius for prolonged periods. Maybe it's because so much of Russia is uninhabitable that prompted Vladimir Putin to ominously declare that the borders of Russia do not end. The United States and NATO would beg to differ. And Russia still hopes of further expansion, and that is being closely monitored and checked. It would seem, though, that for now, Russia is as big as the rest of the world will allow it to be.